everybody, welcome to our second edition of Digging Deep. I'm here with Cody. Hi everyone, Cody the Horticulturist here at Bessie Seeds. And I'm Tara and I do a lot of everything around here. I will be your host for the day. So Cody, while we get into it, what have you been up to? We've been up to so much. We've been starting flower seeds, I've been trimming plants, I've been getting ready to transplant. Spring's coming really fast. Got your forklift training. Got the forklift training. Greenhouse is going to be open in a couple of weeks. Before we know, we're going to be moved in. I can't wait for the greenhouse. I I can't wait. We are having an early um, spring. I heard them say this is the warmest winter on record. Yeah, so Environment Canada is predicting Atlantic Canada is going to have an above normal temperature for spring. Mm -hmm. So right now we're seeing April weather in the end of March. I would say we're probably two or three weeks ahead of what we normally see. So we'll see what April and May brings. Hopefully we don't have any dry spells and hopefully the rain kind of dries up a little bit so yeah although it was snowing earlier today and i heard there might be some snow this weekend yeah who knows it's the maritimes it's gonna change (laughs) um now sophia did have a good question um about no mo may that'd be a good segue into that what are your thoughts about the early spring we're having and no mo may sure so no no mo may is a good practice for you know keeping wildflowers growing in your yard for uh to feed the early pollinators Mm -hmm. they're going to be soon coming out of their hives out of their homes for the winter they're looking for something to eat they're going to be hungry but if you're just mowing all those flowers off you're kind of taking that all away from them so if you you know let your lawn go for a month or three weeks to let the flowers bloom give them something to eat um, it's a great thing to practice. Um, if you can't do that, you know, if we have a lot of rain and your grass is going to be three or four feet tall, uh, maybe practice doing like a little section, like a four by 10 strip for them to eat in and then ro- mow around that. Just choose, just choose a place where like the flowers are coming in the most thick. Yeah. Something I did, I just actually did it yesterday. I put some forget me nots in an area of my yard that grass doesn't grow very well and it is shaded. And I'm hoping that, you know, next year they'll come up and give the bees something to eat a little early. It's a great Um, idea. I don't know if they're going to, I mean, I'm going against package advice and throwing them down like Mm -hmm. mid-March. But they can be a bit, not invasive, but they like to make themselves welcome. They do, yeah. And they'll kind of stick to the shady places. So if you have a really like sunny air, they won't. Te- they won't leave their spot very much underneath the tree. Yeah, I don't care. Maybe my landlord might. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> um, So what are you getting ready to do in the next couple of weeks? We're planting a lot more flowers. We're going to be getting our hanging baskets started. We're going to be getting our containers started. Um, daffodils and bulbs are going to be blooming. We have them in pots. We have them in ground. Those are all going to be coming. Moving into the greenhouse, it's just... We're moving straight ahead. There's no stopping. It's coming. No stopping until about November. Yes, exactly. About November. Um, Some people in the call center wanted us to touch on this, and it's a good question. What's the difference between treated and untreated seed? I'm glad you asked, and I brought some examples today. Nice. Okay, so we'll start with untreated seed. So hold this up for the camera. So this is untreated seed. So this is seed that's raw. It's in its most raw form. There's no uh, fungicides on it. There's no coatings of any kind. This is what they're getting right off the plant from production. Right. This is raw seed. So then we move into pelleted seed, which is, you can see here. So pelleted seed is raw, but it has a clay coating on it. Mm -hmm. And the clay coating is just for ease of planting. It just makes handling the seed a lot better. Um, A lot of farmers might take seed this way for their seeders. It just makes sure that they're not getting like double seeds or they're getting misses or anything. It just makes sure it's gonna be more uniform. Then we move into treated seed. So these are treated beans. So treated uh, seeds have a fungicide coating on them. Mm -hmm. It's more or less there for people who want early establishment from their crops, mostly farmers. If they're trying to, you know, push those beans to be in a week or two earlier, they might want this when it's still wet and cool. Mm -hmm. This just helps with any rot or damping off to make sure that they are going to get that early establishment. And then, like the clay coating, it's hard to see, but... There's a treated seed that's also clay coating. Mm -hmm. Clay coating. So it has the clay coating, it has the treated fungicide on it. Easy to handle and good for early establishment. Now, best practice, wear gloves when you're planting your treated seeds? Yeah, so you always want to make sure you're wearing proper PPE. Wear, you know, latex gloves or other gloves. And then when you're done handling the seed, make sure you're washing your hands thoroughly. Right. And uh, the coating on the seed doesn't actually affect the plant, right? Correct. So once the seed germinates and it starts actively growing, the treatment that's on the seed actively and quickly breaks down and then by the time you're ready to harvest, whether it be a carrot or a bean, Mm -hmm. it's pretty much non-existent at that point. Nice. 
Um, oh, a question from Tracy. Can you explain frost dates and how does that help me know when to start my seeds indoors? Sure. So frost dates is your um, the absolute last date you're going to have frost before the growing season starts. Um, those differ across Canada. Here in PEI, we're about a 5B. Um, so we're kind of right in the middle between, you know, coastal BC and southern Ontario and places like uh, northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan. Um, if it's, you know, if we're talking geraniums, it says start 12 weeks before uh, your last frost date. You got to do a little bit of digging, go to Environment Canada or look up, um, you know, some other articles or resources that tell you when your last frost date is. And then just subtract how many weeks from that date and then that kind of gives you an idea of when you need to start your items. Right. Um, we're going to circle back just a second. Jeff wants to know, should I store the coated seed in any special way? Nope, you can just store it in the normal packaging it comes in. Um, you know, some people do like to keep it away from their other seeds or other like foods and that is recommended. So if you are putting it in the fridge, maybe put it in a sealed con plastic container away from other food. Just, you know, if anything does happen, if it gets wet, none of that's going to leach out. Right. And back to what Tracy's saying about frost dates, um, something that happens here is that we can always get like a freak frost. Yes. So if you're, anything's a little cold, tender, it's maybe best to hold off just a little bit longer. Yeah. So with like frost and weather, nothing's guaranteed. It's never black and white. It just no. varies so much. Like we have a, we have a 10% chance of getting a frost after, I think it's like June 3rd, 4th, mm -hmm. within that first week. I would say seven to, days, seven to 10 days after that, if you have anything super tender, you can put it out then. Um, but that 10%, you know, it might be good for nine years, but on that 10th year, you might get a frost. Basil's gone, tomato's gone, you yeah. gotta start all over. On PEI, it's lore that you don't put any of those things out until after the first full moon in June. Yeah. Once we get into that new moon cycle, um, the Farmer's Almanac and the frost date say something else, but like Islanders will tell you like not until that first full moon. Yeah. But other things like flowers are a little bit more hardy, they can handle it, yeah. but tomatoes don't like it. And like with the last frost dates too, it's really cool and so dependent on geography. Like coastal BC, it's so warm and mild there in the winter time, like they're they can have cactus and other tropical plants out there all winter because they don't get the hard cold like we do in the winter. And they don't have to dig up their gladiolus bulbs. <laughs> they sure don't. <laughs> I always get upset that we have to. Um, Heather wants to know, how long should I leave my grow lights on? I'm running them on a 12-hour timer now to start blue spruce trees. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, you can leave those on a 12-hour cycle. That's what we leave them on here. Uh, we're actively moving into the growing season. Our days are getting longer now, so you can leave them on a 12-hour cycle until they're ready to go outside. Now, um, would you ever recommend leaving the lights on for 24 straight hours? No, you never want to leave them on for a full 24 hours. Um, plants like us, they need a little rest period. So, you know, when the light is on, like on our beautiful calypso between us right now, we can't see it, but slowly it's respirating. It's moving its leaves up and down. With the lights off, it's going to, you know, kind of slow that down a little bit and just kind of, you know, um, help it basically to reserve more energy at night. So you want to make sure that you're getting eight, 10 hours of darkness for plants. I should put a time lapse on this and show there's like micro movements with the leaves as yes. it happens throughout the day as yep. it like lifts up towards the sun and in the evening, it, you know, lifts back down. And it's just very subtle that you'd never see with your naked eye, um, but you can catch it on a time lapse camera. A really a good indication in the summertime, especially if we have a really, really hot, dry summer, if you have uh, pumpkins or cucumbers, the leaves in like early afternoon um, will actually look like they're wilting, like they need water. Mm -hmm. But then when evening comes around, you'll see them perk right back up again. And what they're doing in the afternoon is they're wilting, it's collapsing the leaves. And on the undersides of the leaves, there's little openings where they transmit um, oxygen and moisture. Mm -hmm. And they're curling themselves up to try to reserve as much moisture as they can during those times of drought. So they could use some water, but if they're directly in the ground, they're gonna be fine. Yeah. Uh, I got a question from Jocelyn. She says, I received my box of various seeds Monday, March 18th. The package of seeds were quite hot to the touch as if the box had been sitting on a heater. Should I can be concerned about the viability of the seeds? No, seeds are, pr seeds are pretty hardy. I mean, you can go ahead and plant them. Um, keep the package. If you know if there's any problems, there's a lot number that's on that package. Um, we know the variety, we know the crop name. We can trace all that back. So go ahead and plant them. If for whatever reason they don't grow, then contact us and we'll kind of get to the bottom of it. Yeah, we definitely have a guarantee in all of our seeds, regardless of whether they're coming in hot or not. Um, but seeds are very resilient. They wouldn't want to stay in a heated environment like that long term. No. Um, a short term time shouldn't cause any harm to them. Yep. 
Um, Shirley says, I'm looking forward to getting some asparagus this spring. It's the third year for some of it. How do I know when it's ready to pick? Ready to pick when you're about two, eight inches above the soil, probably right around there. Um, you know, j and just because it's year three, it could be ready to be picked, but you could also let it go for another year. It would absolutely help with the uh, root establishment. Um, but you're looking for around, no bigger than the girth of a Sharpie. Right. And about eight inches tall, something around there. Similar to what you'd see in a store. Exactly. Um, yep. Now, should you pick every no. asparagus leave, off the plant? Leave some of them to photosynthesize and get some of the energy back into the roots. If you do see them coming up and they're only as big as like a pencil or something like that, maybe just let them just keep doing their thing for another year. Revisit again in year four. Awesome. Um, Jocelyn says that she planted her onion seeds immediately, so we should know soon. Perfect. Yeah, definitely time to get those onions in. Yes. Time to get the onions in. Um, another question that we had, what's the difference between heirloom, hybrid, and open pollinated seeds? This is a great question. So heirloom, hybrid, and pollinated seeds. Heirloom aren't in the same category as hybrid and open pollinated seeds. Heirloom is just something that's been passed down through generations. Heirlooms can be open pollinated and they can be hybrid, but they're not like a type of seed. So I guess a good definition for it is if it's been passed through one generation to the next, then it's considered an heirloom seed. Um, there's no specific date. If it's, you know, like the late 1800s, 1940s, 1960s, they're all heirlooms. Um, so yeah, most heirloom seeds are open pollinated. There's not many hybrids out there only because you can't save seeds from hybrid varieties. Mm -hmm. um, moving into what a hybrid is, a hybrid is a very, very specific cross between two parent lines that's hand pollinated um, to get specific traits, whether it be color, flavor, yields, hardiness, whatever. Um, and usually if you save the seed from hybrids, you don't get true. So let's say you're saving from a yellow pepper you're buying a yellow pepper that's a hybrid and you save seed from that you plant the next year, you might get like an elongated orange pepper. Like you have right. no idea what's going to come out. And if it's even like, if it's a hybrid spicy pepper, you might get a pepper that's really, really hot or has no heat at yeah, all. Because maybe they crossed a bell with a hot pepper. Yeah, there's just no way of knowing. Yeah. Um, a, a good indication of that is if you're ever in your compost pile that's not actively composting from like pumpkins and gourds and cucumbers and melons, they, they're all in the same family. So they all, all cross pollinate with each other and you get some pretty funky stuff after a couple of Years. Yeah, we got that weird uh, squash from the pile this year. Yeah, and then open pollinated seeds is just genetic seeds that have stable genetics that you can save year after year. Now, if you have two different varieties of tomatoes in your field and they're open pollinated, mm -hmm. Saving the seeds might give you an accidental hybrid. Exactly. So if you have like a beef steak and you have a little cherry tomato, they cross, then there's going to be something funky going on. But if you have lots of cherry tomatoes all together, then you're going to get a cherry tomato. Yeah. Um, Jeff wants to know, what should I plant for a well-rounded garden for making various preserves to help me have my own homegrown food in the winter? You can grow beets, beans, cucumbers, um, lots of tomatoes, you can do lots of sauces, that sort of thing. Yeah, and a lot of people do, like, preserving has come a long way. People make, like, mustard pickles, but they use zucchini because, you know, yes. they're so prolific. Pro Prolific, yep. Prolific. Um, we've got what zucchini relish downstairs. Yeah, zucchini relish downstairs. Um, one of our coworkers' mom, she made pumpkin jam, and we all got to eat it on ice cream. Mm -hmm. I've never had it; it was delicious. Delicious. Um, something I'm doing at home this year is I'm doing a lot of herbs for Christmas gifts. Yep. Growing herbs, drying them. You have herbs for the winter. Yeah, there's so much you can do, but make sure you grow what you like. Um, if you don't like cabbage or you know sauerkraut, you know don't grow a lot. Yeah, because you're just gonna waste resources. Um, grow carrots instead that you can store in a nice cool area. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's see. Tina says here in Grand Prairie we have a really short growing season. I'm definitely learning that gardening in northern Alberta is much different than PEI. Any advice in dealing with the changes? So if you have a shorter growing season, and I have to apologize, I don't know the exact number of growing days you have in Grand Prairie, um, but if, if it's shorter, uh, use more root vegetables, radishes, carrots, um, beets, parsnips, that sort of thing. Um, use a lot more non-fruit bearing crops like lettuces and kales, um, onions, leeks, that sort of thing. Um, you could probably do peppers and some tomatoes, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, melons, that sort of thing. But, you know, they're going to need a little more protection. Anything that's uh, fruit bearing usually needs a lot more water, a lot more heat in order to produce. Yeah. And you can do things to extend your season, like row covers, mm -hmm. um, cold frames. Yeah. 
um, getting things going in a greenhouse to get, you know, when they get outside, they've got a good head start. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. Before moving spirea shrubs, um, is it best to hard prune, then replant and fertilize, or replant, then prune after it's started to reestablish? These plants are rooted from the branches of the original plant about five years ago. So you never want to prune before you transplant. Um, plants, basically, if, you're, if I was to prune this and then transplant it, I'm taking away active energy that the plant can use, and then I'm stressing it out even more by transplanting it. So what I would do is I would transplant, I would let it establish itself. I wouldn't fertilize right away. Um, you can throw some bone meal in the bottom of the hole, mix it with the soil just to get the roots kind of going after a month or so. And then I would start, you know, cutting it back. Or you can transplant it, let it establish for a season, then the following year start doing your pruning then. Yeah. Um, do you have some carrots, oh, varieties of carrots that last longer in cold storage than others? No, typically, as long as you do it right, most carrots will last the same amount. Sometimes carrots that have less sugar in them might store a little bit better, but you know, it's, you know, they're going to be all the same roughly. Yeah. Um, can I dig up my rose bush and move it now, or is it something I have to do in the fall? As long as the rose bush is still dormant, and as long as you're not having freezing temperatures yet. So if you're hovering five, around five or six degrees during the day, um, you don't see any buds breaking out, you can move it now, no problem. If it's starting to break dormancy now, which it really shouldn't be, um, then go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. All right. So another question. Let's see. James wants to know, are there any organic gardening techniques or products that you recommend for pest management or disease? So my favorite for pest management is always rope cover. Yeah. yeah. You just have to be mindful on the fruit bearing crops, like, you know, the pumpkins, the melons, that sort of thing, that when the flowers start coming out, you take that row cover off so pollination can happen. Right. You need the bees. Exactly. Um, and then for disease, there's not a whole lot of products out there. Your best bet for keeping disease out organically is doing like cultural or mechanical cultural tips. Um, you know, if you're getting leaf spots in your tomatoes, you might have a problem with blight in your tomatoes. First of all, you can use the uh, blight resistant tomatoes. Those work really, really well. Second of all, you want to increase airflow, maybe trim out some of the foliage. You just want to get airflow in there to make sure that the leaves can start to dry off. Yeah. And if you see signs of disease and pests, sometimes it's best to just pull that plant to save the other plants. Exactly. Um, you know, it, stuff can be soil borne. It can be from water. It can be um, in the air. If you're, you know, planting onions or something for three years in the same location and they're not doing well, you're getting rot, maybe it's time to rotate. So plant something else out of that family there, put them somewhere else, see how they do. That's a really good tip too. Yeah. And what about for pests besides the row covers? Besides the row covers, after that, you can do some hand picking. Um, I know some people like to use like some like end dolls and stuff. I don't think they're organically certified though. I'd have to check on that. I do have um, one of our slug traps here. Yeah, those are great for slugs. Um, and we also have uh, traps for Japanese beetle as well. Um, Japanese beetle are becoming a really, really big problem right now in Canada. They're just flocking to trees and shrubs and just like decimating them. Yeah. So these traps, um, it's not a spray. They're attracted to like a lure. They basically hit it, they fall in, and they essentially drown. And then yeah. you just have to empty them out once in a while. I don't know if you can see that little display of the bag there. But we do have it on our website. You can find all the stuff there. Oh, and the earwig traps. These are so great. You just have to remember to empty them out. Yes. These are really fun. So recently I learned that earwigs can't back up so they like you know dark areas mm -hmm. they crawl in and then they're stuck because they can't back up yeah so then you just have to empty them out every day or so and if you have chickens they'll be like so happy if you feed them to them yeah um, another question do we have any tips on using bio mulch and how to keep it down without tearing I know it's so hard if you don't have like a tractor implement that'll help you mm -hmm get more hands get two or three people to help you you want to make sure you're holding it tight as you're unrolling it then the other person or the other two people are you know burying the sides and the end with soil um if when laying it out you do start to see some ripples coming throw another shovel full of soil on top of it you basically want to make sure it's nice and tight there's no ripples that the wind can catch in um, if rips do happen just keep tossing some more soil on, onto it Mm -hmm. It won't last the entire season. It will start to break down after like four or six weeks. Uh, again, just throwing more soil on top of it, just trying to stop the wind from getting underneath it and try to stop the rip from getting bigger. 
Yeah, and um, don't do it on a windy day. Do not do it on a windy day. <laughs> Which is hard on PEI. Yes. Um, Chris wants to know um, what's the best, uh, when is it best to prune trees and are there different zones affected differently? So the best, so pruning trees really depends on what tree it is. Mm -hmm. If you're spring flowering, you want to prune after the flower. If you're fall flowering, you want to prune in, um, in the spring. Right. So, so lilac bushes, you prune when? So you would prune those after flower because they're flowering in the spring. And what about the spireas? The spireas, you can prune those after they flower as well if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, spireas are really, they handle being cut back really well, so like, cut them at any time. Yeah, it's yes. hard to hurt a spirea. Yeah. Um, and what about a hydrangea bush? Those Not depend a tree. On, okay, those depend. So usually they flower on, um, I think it's old, old year's wood, so set the first year's wood. So you want to trim them after they flower, yes. Um, so geraniums, after they've sprouted, how soon should you put them under grow lights? Right away. Yeah. yeah. We had this question last week too. Um, there can be some like old information that says to sprout them in the dark, mm -hmm. but it's not necessary. No, I planted ours a few weeks ago and it was on a Friday and I came in the Monday and they were popping up. It was after three days. I had them under lights the entire time, but if I had done that on a Wednesday or a Thursday and they germinated over the weekend when I wasn't here with oat lights, they would be very tall and straggly and they wouldn't be very happy. Yeah. And what do you do if you've got tall, straggly transplants? You want to give, give them more light. Yeah. So they'll, they'll kind of, plants will tell you when they're not happy. If they're really elongated and tall, just move them to someplace with more light. And will they bounce back or is it best to start over? If it's, if you're that early where you only, you still haven't seen the first true set of leaves, you can just start over again. Um, here's a potato question from Noah. How many potatoes in a three pound bag and how much yield will you typically get from a three pound bag? So potatoes in the bags, it all depends on what potato it is. Um, you know, you can get, you know, gems, which are really small and then you get russets, which are much larger. Mm -hmm. It totally depends, depends on the potato. Fingerlings, there's going to be more than there would be russets. Um, totally depends. Uh, in terms of like yields, anywhere from five to 10 potatoes per plant could be more than that, it could be less than that. It just all depends on your environment, your soil moisture, stress levels, pests, nutrient levels, like there's just so many factors. So many variables. We do have a bunch of um, potato facts coming out. Um, March 31st is National Potato Day. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a bunch of fun infographics that'll be coming out for Potato Day as well. Yes. Um, the answer though is not enough. Not enough. There's never enough potatoes. Never enough. <laughs> Um, Emma wants to know, garlic, what causes garlic to turn brown and not grow as big as it has in the past? Why would it rot so quickly? It's probably, if we're talking about last season, it's probably because it was just so, so wet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our garlic did well, but we have very sandy soil. If you have a very heavy clay soil, that's not going to dry out very fast. With all the rain we got last year, it's just going to rot. Um, and if you are getting that rot in the soil now, I would start thinking about where you're going to put it this year. Right. Um, you don't want to put it in that same spot now that there's that rot and that fungus in that soil now. So just think about a new area you're going to be And you should always move your garlic, right? Yeah. You should, o you should never be planting in the same spot more than one year. Um, and how long until you can circle back to that? Until you've run out of spots? Usually three years, but if you want to get real technical, five years. Yeah. And I know, and I know not everyone can do that and that's where pots and containers come into play. Um, yeah. And doing a soft neck garlic in the spring exactly. instead of a hard neck. Yeah. Maybe do a couple years of soft neck to give your, uh, your area a little time off. So, um, Heather wants to know, should I pinch my milkweed seedlings? You can pinch them if you want to, if they're getting tall. Um, you're just pinching back to, you know, leave four, uh, three or four sets of leaves. Um, and never more than a third because that'll stress out the plant too much. Yeah, milkweed's pretty happy. Um, it'll even like flower the first year. Yeah. And then the next year, look out. Yes. <laughs> uh, a question from Jeff. What should I typically be using for soil amendments before planting? Compost and organic matter is the number one thing you can do. Yeah. Well rotted manure and compost. That's the, cannot recommend that enough. Even if you can do it every year, it's the best thing you can do for your soil every year. And I love worm castings. Yes. I think that's like an underdog in the garden. Um, in my soil, out in the garden, yep. top dressing. Yes. I even know people who do like a natural mulch 
of like bark and then maybe the next year they top coat top dress that with compost then the year after that they do the mulch again so they're kind of getting the mulch compost cycle going and then the mulch is actively breaking down as well okay i got a question from tiffany she says hi how sh how often should i be fertilizing my veggie gardens i'm using mostly grow bags it all depends on what your crops are fruiting crops like strawberries you're going to feed them a lot more often than say like carrots right and like kales, lettuces, um, they don't need as much fertilizer either. Usually maybe, you know, a half feed every couple of weeks or maybe a full feed once a month, that sort of thing. And would you fertilize all your veggies the same? No, it all depends on what your veggie is. Yeah. Um, so like corn would get a different kind of... Yeah, so different ratios for different plants. Um, you know, usually a well-balanced, you know, triple 20, even like a half feed of that for like peppers and tomatoes. Corn needs a little more nitrogen. Root crops want a, lot of, a little more phosphorus. Like, it just totally depends. Yeah. There's definitely not a one-size-fits-all for things. No. And there's actually a really good rhyme, if you're looking at the fertilizer ratio, that lets you know what each uh, percentage does. I have not heard this rhyme. Okay. So the first number <laughs> is nitrogen, the second is phosphorus, and the last is potassium. Mm -hmm. So nitrogen is really good for foliage and stem growth. Mm -hmm. um, phosphorus is good for root growth. And then potassium is really good for plant health and fruiting body. Mm -hmm. So the good rhyme is up, down, and all around. If you can oh. remember that while you're looking at fertilizers, you can kind of get a gist of what's in it and what it's going to be good for. I've never actually heard that. I thought you were going to sing for me. Though. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was going to be like a nursery rhyme. Um, another question, um, do you recommend dahlias to be planted in pots and raised beds? Yep, you can absolutely plant dahlias in pots and raised beds. Just make sure you have enough room for the tubers at the end of the season. Um, when we're nearing September, early October, the root systems are going to be huge. They're going to be flowering like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure that they're not drying out every day. And the best way you can do that is just make sure to have the appropriate size pot for them to grow in. Yeah, and um, we put lots of dahlias in um, containers last year. Yep, yep, they do just fine. Make excellent cut flowers. We've got them tubers in the basement. Yep. Looking forward to pulling them out. Um, a question from Charlotte. She wants to know, are hostas edible? They sure are, and I actually just recently learned about this as well. So you eat them almost like a bok choy. So once they're, you know, a few inches above the soil surface, you snap them off from the rest of the root mass and they're a nice tender, they're very sweet, and you fry them up and use them where you would use bok choy. Interesting. I know the flowers are edible and people use the flowers in salads and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, Apparently it's used quite a bit in uh, Eastern Asian countries. I bet it'd be like the hosta would bounce back. It wouldn't mind having... Oh no, they would love... And... Yeah, because the hostas like to be split too, so I'm sure breaking off that little growth point helps it with uh, growing. Oh, since we're talking about splitting hostas, when would you split your hostas? I would split them in the spring. Usually when you're seeing a little bit of growth poke through, you can just go with a shovel or something. Um, cut them in either fours or in threes. Twos is yes never usually enough, so the more the better. And how long would you wait until you're, like, how would you do a new hosta that's only, let's say, like two years old? Would you split that? No, it usually... It all depends because, you know, you get great ginormous hostas and then, like, uh, you get very small, like, most years ones. Mm -hmm. all depends on their size. Um, maybe if, you know, you notice the leaves starting to yellow, they're looking a little more water stressed, then maybe it's time to start splitting them. There's just so much competition going on that mm -hmm. they just need more room. Remember that hosta that we had over in the trials? Hostas little... are so resilient. But, like, the leaves, like, as big as my head, yeah. it was really hard to even pull that out. People, so I know big. some people really don't like hostas, but they're just... In my opinion, so underrated, you can get some really, really cool hostas. I like hostas. I like them when they're not touching and like there's different varieties, um, really good for shade. They have to be like maintained nicely. My favorite one, and I have back in my childhood home in Nova Scotia, is one called Curly Fries, which we carry. It's yeah. one of my favorites. Um, Bev, uh, the owner of Vessi's, um, he lives next door and he's got beautiful hostas and like he makes me he made me appreciate hostas again yeah and they're all like evenly grown and like they fire at the same time like they're just immaculate they're they're so good and like they go in they get messy they get overgrown but his are perfect yeah. i love them um tracy wants to know how important is companion planting i plant tomatoes peppers and cucumbers are they okay to plant together you can plant together um you know you just have to be careful of competition especially with like tomatoes and cucumbers and what was the other crop you mentioned um peppers yeah so those are all fruit bearing crops so they're all like really looking for moisture and nutrients they're looking for a lot of sunshine if they're planted really close together they're competing with each other and they might become more stressed out you make it more tomatoes, less cucumbers, vice versa. Like you just yeah. have to be careful where you're planting stuff. 
Especially if you're doing like um, an indeterminate tomato, maybe it's gonna like grow really high and shade out. Um, yeah. You might want to do like basil or marigolds as companion. Like yeah, some, some dill, some lavender, that sort of thing. Anything super scented, I find, you know, yeah. I never guarantee it, but I have seen it, you know, tolerate some deer coming into the garden. They might give a little sniff of the lavender and be like, mm, no, I don't want that. We're really lucky we don't have deer. I know. We're extremely lucky we don't have deer on the island. Yeah, we just have rabbits. That's yeah. really all we have to contend with with our gardens. Yeah. Um, Heather wants to know, I'm thinking about growing lavender this year. What type is best? You can go with any type. They're all good. Um, the Hidcott and the English Lavender are the best. Um, we do carry one called Fragrant Butterflies, and I'm just not sure where uh, you're growing. Is that the lady from Grand Prairie? Um, maybe. Okay. Anyway, uh, the Fragrant Butterflies isn't super hardy to all of Canada. It's about like a 6A, 6B. So we wouldn't be able to grow it as a perennial here, but someone in southern Ontario could, like around Windsor. Yeah, and if you start them by seed, you should be starting them, you know, now-ish. Yeah, they should be started now. Um, we do sell roots in our catalog, which is going to give you another head start. Yeah. Um, get them blooming faster, beautiful faster. Mm -hmm. um, Aiden wants to know, why are squash producing male flowers long before the females come out? So pumpkins, squash, melons always push out male flowers first before female flowers. It's about seven to ten days before you start seeing the female flowers. Mm -hmm. So the female flowers are the fruit bearing flowers, which is where you get, you know, your melons, whatever from. Yep. But the male ones are for poll pollination only. So they start pushing them out early to start attracting the bees to the plant so they're not wasting the female flowers and wasting all the energy putting into, you know, pre preparing the ovule and the female flowers. And what if when the female flowers show up, there are no male flowers? You'll still get some cross pollination. Um, if you're seeing that, you might get some deformed fruit, which does happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, zucchini is a good example. They get, you know, where it's attached to the plant, it might look kind of regular and then it'll come to like a fine tip very quickly yeah that's usually a pollination issue so more flowers in the garden that sort of thing maybe plant different cucurbits cucumbers with your squash uh, pumpkins with your squash that sort of thing um heather says she is from pei hi heather <laughs> so fragrant butterflies will not survive here no but you'll no. get them going this year um and you can always bring them in in a pot for the winter yep take them out next next year um oh julie's watching hi julie <laughs> Um, a, someone named Julia wants to know, when do I harvest my watermelons? So harvest your, so we've learned over the years <laughs> that watermelons, from the day you transplant until you harvest, you follow the days to maturity to a T. You do not harvest before that day. No. And even then when you know if you're doing like Tom, I think is 80 days to maturity from transplant, even at 80 days, I'm still like, wait two or three more days. Look for the little tendril where it's attached to the main vine to be totally brown and crispy, and then you can start harvesting. There's nothing worse than thinking your watermelon is ready and cutting it open and having it be like white, basically. Days to maturity from transplant is a must. Do not a bear must. off that at all. Um, I can't wait for watermelon season. Oh Our God. watermelons do really, really well here. I'm so excited. Yellow doll, like I would, I would give up everything just for yellow doll. Right. Um, Heather wants to know, I started my Cracker Jack Marigolds early this year. Just notice what looks like air roots on the stem. Are they like tomatoes and can be planted deeper? As far as I know, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. You might start to get some rot in your stem, so I wouldn't do that. You know, usually those roots will just kind of dry up and they won't, you know, um, produce anything. So you're fine just to plant them as deep as they're planted now. Yeah, I think tomatoes are the only things that like that planting of deep wound, those fine hairs that turn into roots. Yeah, they're, I mean, willows do that too, but no one's going to be taking a willow tree like this and like plunking it six feet under the soil. Um, I mean, roses will do it, but roses do that enough on their own. Yeah, you don't need do. to encourage it. <laughs> no, no, they don't need encouragement. They're doing fine without us. All right, so that is all I have for questions that were asked in advance. Does anyone else have any more questions? While we wait for that, I've been doing a lot of talking. Yes. But now I want to ask you some questions, so I have All a right. fun game today. I do love games. So I brought 10 varieties that we carry. Okay. They are all varieties we grew between flowers and vegetables last summer. Okay. I'm going to list the crop and the variety name to you, and I want you to give me your first memory or your best memory of that variety. All right, so like word association almost? Essentially, yes. Yes. Okay. So our first one we're going to start with is a Gerber Daisy Revolution Mix. Oh my god, they were so pretty. We had them over in the display gardens out there, and we have them in the store. Mm -hmm. They've been blooming in the store. Each bloom lasts like minimum three weeks. We've had color all season long. 
They're so pretty. I love when they give like the the freak when they have like a double bloom in one. I know. We had the red one down there, and it a solid four weeks it was blooming, just one single flower, if not five weeks. Yeah, they're best. Like they should be house plants. They're they're one of my favorites, and I think we're putting them in the displays again this year. Yes, we are. I think Joyce did that for me. Yes. Okay, our next one, banana. Oh, the bananas. Our bananas, what, we planted those last November. Mm -hmm. So they're almost like a year and a half year old. And we put them outside in the trials, and now they're in the building all around to go back outside. They're what, like eight, six to eight feet tall yep. in places? They're so pretty. People have actually been naming our bananas, too. We do. We do have a Bartholomew. I don't know any other names, though. I haven't heard any yet, but now we have to keep track of Bartholomew and make sure he returns to the right person next fall. Yes, yes, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, hibiscus Luna Red. Luna Red, oh my god. Our um, our butterfly formed its chrysalis on the Luna, and I looked at it every day. Um, it bloomed for weeks, weeks on end. It blew all of our other hibiscus that we were trialing out of the water. Um, I took some home and planted it. Yep. Um, gigantic, gigantic flowers. It was quite amazing when we were down there and you screamed from across the trials. You're like, Cody, there's a hibiscus <laughs> over here. And I had to come like running over and there's, you know, a hibiscus, like a dinner plate size. And it was just huge. And it was so much earlier from the other varieties we were growing. And lasted so much longer. Like when we say we have the best, like we really have the best. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was so impressive. Yeah. Um, I have it now in my front yard. And even my husband who really doesn't necessarily like when I bring home flowers. Um, he likes them. Yeah, and they once they started flowering, they were there for the season. They were there for the season. Yep. And where I have them at home, it's partial shade, and they still liked it, and yep. they still bloomed, and they didn't get stretchy at all. Yeah. Okay, our next one is a winter squash, Delicata. <gasps> delicata, oh my God, that's one of my favorite squash. I ate my last squash, and I'm very sad. Mm -hmm. I even, I have, no, I have the freak left. Okay. The double. Yeah. Um, delicata is one of my favorite squash. Are we growing it this year? We didn't grow it last year. I think we're going to try to grow some this year. There's some interesting trial ones. You know, I don't want to give away too much, but there's some interesting Delicata trials out there. Are we growing the candy roaster? We might, yes. I just want to eat all the squash. So the Delicata, <laughs> I don't think they're super common, um, but they're like elongated. They're like a tan color and they have green stripes on them. Mm -hmm. um, cut them in half lengthways. Uh, scoop out the innards and then start half mooning them roast them in the oven with salt and some oil and I like them more than sweet potato fries I love them I love squash I ate so much squash this fall um, like I almost cried when I ate my last squash yeah, I'm in the same boat as you like the delicata squash my favorite I can't get enough of it yeah mm, squash okay our next one tomato cherry falls cherry falls I'm not a big tomato person I do like some tomatoes. Cherry Falls really impressed me though because they were beautiful in their in the container garden. Yeah. Um, all bloomed at once, a big, lots of fruit, nice and sweet. Mm -hmm. Not my favorite tomato though, so I'm surprised you threw that in there. I think the plants are just so pretty and they just push all of their red fruit out of all, all, all out at once. once and they're just gorgeous plants and they're just... I took that picture. There must have been like 200 flowers on that like Easy. one plant. The yields are just outrageous. Yeah, they do. They are determinants though. So they, you know, they're kind of like a quick harvest. Get ready to eat tomatoes done. when they're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next one, carrot Napoli. Napoli, my favorite. My favorite to make carrot cake. Um, the minute that our Napoli's are ready, I make carrot cake for the whole building. Yeah. Um, sorry if any of the other buildings are watching. Um, <laughs> this whole building gets carrot cake. Um, yes. Usually a couple times a year. Um, Napoli's are my favorite. They're the sweetest. Mm -hmm. Napoli is, you know, our top selling carrot. And it's, you know, I think we have unanimous decision that it is the sweetest carrot that we carry. Yeah, everyone Easily. tries it. I don't Easily. think anyone's ever beaten it. It's very, very sweet. Um, tomato Sun Gold. Ah, uh, there's my favorite tomato. Um, that is the tomato that made me love tomatoes again. Yes. Um, I could even like close my eyes and tell you where it is in the, where it was in the trial field because I could just close my eyes and go to it and eat it. It's like eating candy. It, and that's not even an understatement. Like for people who don't like tomatoes, grow sun gold and then just pop one in your mouth and it's just sugar and sweetness. Yeah. Sugar and sweetness. You don't get that tartness. You don't get the acidity. It's just sweet. It's just sweet. Oh, Julie says it's the best tomato. It is the best it tomato. It is the best tomato. And like, 
Yeah, I don't like the acid, and I don't like a lot of. I call it goopiness. Mm-hmm. Um, the Sun Gold is a perfect tomato. Yeah. I don't. I don't think you can get anything better. No, and again, that's another unanimous decision decision by everyone. Yeah. Just if you don't like tomatoes, grow that one. Grow sun gold. But keep in mind, it's gonna grow like six feet. And yeah, it's gonna it's gonna grow pretty vigorous. And it's gonna produce so much, so much. Yeah. I wonder if you get candy them. Okay, almost done. Okay. Our next one, pumpkin lemonade. Lemonade, so pretty, so pretty. Um, not my favorite pumpkin though. Oh. Do you not know my favorite pumpkin? I don't know your favorite pumpkin. John knows my favorite pumpkin. Okay. Um, it's renegade. Oh, you like Renegade? Renegade's an awesome pumpkin. The color is like that color of orange. It's mm-hmm. almost like a reddish orange. The only thing I don't like about the Renegade is the handle can be a little mm-hmm. annoying. Um, but Renegade's my favorite pumpkin. Renegade's a great pumpkin. It's good for, you know, market gardeners, commercial growers. It's a great field pumpkin. 40 bin count um, for any growers out there listening. You can easily get 40 <laughs> fruit in a bin. Um, yeah. Lemonade's good, though, because you need that contrast. Because everyone wants the orange pumpkins, then they want a white and a yellow yeah. to give that pop. So for anyone listening who doesn't know what lemonade is, um, open up, even if you have our catalog or, you know, after the stream, go to the website, search lemonade. It is a vibrant yellow field pumpkin, and it is just so pretty. Um, And then we have a yellow popcorn pumpkin that is covered in what looks like popcorn, like popped kernels of popcorn. It's a great name. It looks like a giant piece of popcorn that popped out of the soil in the field. Yeah, and it looks white, but when it ripens, it goes like full yellow. And it's like, it's so ugly, it's pretty. Yeah. And talking on pumpkins too in trials, there are some stinking cool pumpkins coming in the next three years. Pumpkins are my favorite crops. Stay tuned for those because they... It's nothing you've ever seen before in pumpkins. It's so cool. It sucks because like we get to, we get to know things that other people don't. Know. I know, and it's hard because I really want to talk about them, but I can't talk about them. Yeah. Like like a broccoli and like a lettuce that no one knows about. There's a tomato like, on my list too. Like oh, it's gonna be a good it's gonna oh, be a good two or three. Years. Is that the tomato that Je- Julie likes? It. I think it is. I think it is. I think it is. Um, Shauna also loves delicata. Yes. Okay, so we have two more left for you. Okay. Pepper Pathfinder. Pathfinder, oh my god, that day in the field that you were like, a customer said their Pathfinders weren't hot. Will you eat this? And I took a bite and it was so hot because it was so stressed out. It's so hot. Um, yeah. And our plants were stressed because we had a really dry season that year mm-hmm. and I had no milk and I was like hiccuping in the field. Um, I regretted that decision pretty much immediately. Yeah. <laughs> um, when we grew Pathfinder a couple of years ago when it first showed up on our radars, the yields just blow you out of the water so many peppers um you know they the peppers get you know upwards of five to seven inches long um and they stay green so it's hard to see from far away but you get up to the plant and you just there's must be 20 or 30 fruit on one plant alone yeah and they just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming and they don't stop until frost and they're a great pepper because you can eat them green or you can wait until they turn red um I don't know if people know, but like sriracha is just a red jalapeno. It's a specific variety of jalapeno, but it's just a red jalapeno. The, you know, the more mature it gets, usually the sweeter it gets, the more hot it gets. Yeah. Um, The flavor really develops. Yeah. Yeah. I can't complain about Pathfinder. I will never forget that day that you made me eat that though. (laughs) If if you're, if you're making like salsa or anything and you need hot peppers and a lot, Pathfinder is super. Pathfinder is perfect. Okay, last one. Okay. And I know this one's your favorite for a fact. Okay. Watermelon Yellow Doll. Oh, it's just the best watermelon in the whole world. I I sometimes work in commercial sales. I sometimes help out in the call center. I do not make commission, and I should get commission on Yellow Doll. The amount of people that I talk into buying that, it's just the perfect watermelon. It's sweeter. It produces a lot of fruit because it's a smaller size. Mm-hmm. Instead of getting like three to five big watermelon, you're getting like five to eight smaller yes. ones. Um, they're, they're just sweeter. They are. Um, vibrant, bright yellow color inside as soon as you cut it open. It's truly underrated. Um, you know, most people think watermelon, rose color, red when you cut it open. No. Cut this open. Yellow tastes just like a watermelon. There's no difference other than the color. Kids love it. We've had a lot of um, different organizations came this summer to help with, you know, harvesting. We, you know, we cut open a couple of watermelons at the end of the day for them, and everyone just flocks to the yellow doll. Oh, my God. I miss Gus and his love for the yellow watermelons. I know. Yeah. Um, one of our staff members, I used to, like, cut up yellow watermelon to send home with him. Um, it is the best watermelon. People will, like, accuse you of it being pineapple, but it's like, no, it's a watermelon. You the have watermelon. to eat it. Does grows really well here. Underrated. Recommend it to everyone. Everybody. Um, we have some questions while okay. we're doing Okay, we're all so done. We'll, so we can go back we'll to go questions back. now. Okay. All right. So 
Anita wants to know, I live in zone five. I have glads and dahlias. Do I have to dig them up every year? Yes, you do. Yes. It's so sad. Yes. Um, my advice for that is the day you plant your glads and your dahlias, put a Google appointment in your phone to remember to dig them up. Yes. Like, look at when your last frost is and be like, go dig up your glads. Because you're going to forget because they're probably still going to look nice. Yeah. They can handle a little bit of light frost. It might kill the foliage, which actually you kind of want. So mm -hmm. you want that light frost to take the foliage down. Once that happens, you can go out. Once all the foliage is brown, crispy, not living anymore, cut them off, dig up the tubers or the uh, corms, and bring them inside for the winter. Yeah. Unfortunately, places like... Coastal BC, they get to leave them in the ground. Mm -hmm. They get the rhinoculus too. Yeah. We don't have that luxury. Um, Julie says, Hi again. How close do you have to grow lights for emerging seedlings? Zinnia, Gerber daisy, geranium, asters are sprouting now. It depends on how strong your grow light is, but if we're just talking like a single fluorescent, like T5 grow light, uh, three to four inches, something like that. Um, you know, much closer, you might start burning the leaves much further away than they might start to stretch. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you see them stretching, move them closer. If you see the tips kind of curling up and being a little crispy brown, yeah. move them. Yeah. Um, do you prune indeterminate tomatoes to one single growth point slash leader? We don't here. So that's one of our trialing points is that, you know, um, when we're growing a tomato, we don't expect all of the customers to trim their tomatoes. Right. So we want to know what it does untrimmed, um, but we do recommend it for airflow and for late in the season and, you know, to avoid blight. It mm -hmm. is a good thing to do. We just don't do it here because we want to make sure that we can plunk it in, fertilize it once in a while, and then kind of forget about it and just eat the fruit when we need to eat it. Right, because we cater to so many different customers. We got commercial growers and we got home gardeners, and some home gardeners are out there every day, and some just don't have the time, but exactly. still want the fruit. So we want to make sure, bare minimum, the tomato is going to do what it's going to do. Yeah, we try and do like a little bit of a prune and taking out some of the suckers um, for airflow, because otherwise it does just get so full, unmanageable. Yeah, if we know there's a stretch of like some cold, um, wet weather coming, we might go out and do a little bit of thinning. Picking tomatoes last year with our, what, 86 varieties? Yes. Was basically a full-time job. Absolutely. We were really lucky to have the PEI Food Exchange come in and help clean our fields and pick the tomatoes. Yeah. And get them to like those food banks, the community fridges. Very fortunate. <laughs> we, we didn't have time yeah. and we don't want the produce to go to waste. No, we don't waste any produce if we can help it. Yeah, so many tomatoes. Um, Jem MB says, hi guys, long time listener, first time caller. Cody, if I could buy any vegetable, which would you, which would it be and why? Tara, same question. Okay. Oh, I got to think about that. I'm going to say vegetable for eating. I'm going to break it down. Vegetable for eating. I'm going to go straight to watermelons probably. It's, Yellow doll has to win. There's like... <laughs> watermelons are definitely up there for me. I like a good squash. I like the cucurbits. They're my favorite family. Mm-hmm. If you're growing something that you're maybe not going to eat, then I would look at specter, popcorn, lemonade, any of the pumpkins. Yeah. I might have to... So obviously it's yellow doll, but like besides yellow doll, it would have to be probably squash. Um, like a veg vegetable spaghetti squash. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite, eating like spaghetti bowls. Um, what else besides that? I'm going to say... Did he say vegetable only? He did say vegetable. I was going to say flower. You can do a flower. Um, flower would be our new red lupin. What is it? Newcastle? Yeah. yeah. Gorgeous. 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 If I had to choose a flower, I would probably have to choose the new Sweet William, the Dianthus, the Sweet Rose Magic. <gasps> I forgot about that. We grew that and the flower came up with like the different colors on one stalk and I was like, where has this been my whole life? Like, this is what I want in my flower life. I don't even know how the plant produces so many individual different colored flowers on one bloom. I know, but it was spectacular. Gorgeous, all season long. Yeah. All season long. Um, okay. We are caught up with questions. Perfect. Um, do I have a question for you? Um, I think you brought some products with us last time we were talking about last week. Oh, yeah. Week. I brought corn with us because people Ooh, were yeah. asking about our corn and cross-pollination. That's a great example. Um, and people wonder, like, how you can tell the different varieties of corn so you shouldn't cross-pollinate them. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see that there is red corn on here. This got too close to our Fiesta. red popcorn corn yeah um so 
if you were to eat that, that pollination has, that cross pollination is in this kernel, it's going to affect the taste now. Not yes. if you plant it the way it tastes now. So what we're looking at with corn is that the seeds, this is, this is the ge next generation, um, you know, whereas watermelon, if it was to cross pollinate, it wouldn't affect the flesh, it would right. affect the seeds. And that's what we're eating here is the seeds. Right. So this robust, our popcorn corn crossed with our fiesta, and we got a couple of kernels in there that turned brownish red. Yeah, and when you're looking at our catalog to see varieties so you don't cross-pollinate your um, corn, you want to look at like SH2. Yes. Um, and then what's another one? Uh, uh, SE, SU. SY. SY. Um, and just check out the varieties when you're looking. Um, if you do want to plant two different kinds of two different species, put some space in between it or time. And it even goes a little bit further than that. Like, you know, SH2s, there's yellow, bicolor, and whites. Mm -hmm. If you want to do yellows, just do yellows. Right. If you want to do bicolor, just do bicolor. If you want to do white, just do white. Um, never, you know, stay within the same um, category like the super sweets and then stay within the same color variation. Uh, Tiffany wants to know the watermelon I love. Can it be grown in Newfoundland? I, it's going to be hard. Newfoundland gets really, really cold and they don't have the growing season that we have. It would be very difficult. You'd need a lot of protection. You'd need a lot of maintenance. Row covers probably. Yeah. I guess it depends on where, but Tiffany could also come see us and I promise I will share the watermelon with you. Yes. Just one though. Um, Heather wants to know what was the flower that you said? Oh, the dianthus. It's the sweet rose magic. Yeah, and I think it is on the front couple pages of our catalog with our new items. Yes. Um, it is listed under dianthus. Yes. It is It is really pretty. And they were quite tall. Yeah. Um, the blooms lasted a long time. Made an excellent cut flower. I highly recommend. Um, Shauna says, are there special varieties of seeds to grow for sprouts or microgreens? Yes, there is. So, um, you know, if you look through our catalog, we have uh, microgreens in a sprout section. Um, almost any seed can be used as a sprout, but we do offer specific seeds for sprouts. Mm -hmm. But the term microgreen and sprouts aren't interchangeable. Microgreens, you know, you would grow as a normal plant like this starting off. You would just harvest it at a very, very immature stage. Mm -hmm. Whereas sprouts, you're putting in a special um, high humidity, high moisture environment. You're waiting, you know, between five to ten days for them to sprout, get a little soft, and then you're eating them. You're, there's no soil involved with sprouts. Yeah, I have sprouts going on my counter at all times. Yeah, um, I sprout them for my birds because my birds love them. Yeah, um, that's the great thing about sprouts is that you just you know if you buy our sprouting kit, throw some seeds in and just get on a cycle of doing them every you know three to five days and you have just an instant cycle uh, or a cycle of uh, sprout seed all the time. Yeah, because there's four trays, so you start one tray. Don't start all four at once. You're going to be overrun with sprouts. Yeah. Um, but I did put alfalfa in my fridge when we were going over to the Horticulture Congress in um, the Valley. And I put alfalfa in there and then it got like pushed to the back. Yes. And a month later, they were still fresh. There you go. Um, because think about it, I mean, they last in the store yep. and they have a week to two weeks, but they have travel time, packing time. Sprouts are really, really easy to do. And then once you just get on that cycle, keep them on your counter next to the sink every time you're doing dishes, washing your hands, give them a quick rinse, put them back. It's that easy. All right. Um, Angie says, when you start seed and package says start six to eight weeks before last frost, but does that take germination time of 20 days or do you add that to the six to no, eight weeks? No, that's from sowing date until frost date. So that's from the time you put it in the soil to the time that it's going outside. Yeah. And what would have a germination date of 20 days besides like bananas? Yeah. So a lot of flowers take a little bit of time again that all depends on environment mm -hmm. um i have some impatience downstairs that are taking their sweet time testing I have, your patience yes they are <laughs> i have some impatience that popped up you know after seven to ten days and i have some we're pushing 15 to 20 and they're like no nah, I'm, I'm good I'm, I'm gonna stay here for a bit <laughs> i'm just gonna stay here yeah um stacy wants to know what are your top three cut flowers top three cut flowers i would say gerbers have to be in there for sure um zinnias oh i i change it zinnias is at the top grab a zinnia mix of all different colors mm -hmm. you want to make sure you get the tall ones don't get the dwarf ones get the you know like the benaries giant or something like that mm -hmm. and plant them in a nice you know four by eight bed you're gonna have a range of colors all summer long cut flowers almost daily basically not even weekly like almost daily even the dahlias, I mean, their stems aren't as long, um, but God, they're pretty. Yeah. They just bloom so long. They're gorgeous. 
What else is a good cut flower? Um, I really like when like the astilbes come up and mm -hmm. they have the plumes mm -hmm. and they just add such character. I made a vase for the store and it had lupins and astilbe in it and mm -hmm. it was gorgeous. Like it was such a contrast. Two of my favorites and I think they're kind of overlooked as like, and that's not exciting. Like they're pushed to the side. Mm -hmm. I really like coneflower, echinacea, mm -hmm. super hardy, flowers all summer, makes a great cut flower, and rutabecchia. The rutabecchia we had um, planted in front of equipment last year. I think it was the cherry brandy. Yeah. It was it was gorgeous. And it bloomed all season long. Yep. All season long, right till frost. Makes excellent cut flowers. But again, the echinacea, like like the mixes, super hardy. You get a whole bunch of different colors. Lots of cut flowers all summer. Can't go wrong. And the bonus of echinacea and rutabecchia is that they're going to come back year after year. Yeah, um, they will. Where the zinnias, you're going to have to start them again. Yes. Uh, what else would be a good cut? We actually have a, a bed of echinacea across the road for a display bed. It's just echinacea, and that's it. And we have a mix of, you know, our seed echinacea and then some of our spring roots as well from our bulk catalog. Right. And I don't know if you know this or not, but when Joyce and I were, like, cleaning up the beds at the end of the year, we were, like, taking their seeds off, like, the dead flowers, and we were, like, sprinkling them. So that bed's going to look fantastic in, like, two to three years. We were like, got to do it for the bees and the that's butterflies. Right. That's right. Um, what's your top three herbs? Top three herbs. Hmm. I really do like a good fresh basil, a nice like glossy leaf basil. Mm -hmm. One of the Prosperas, those are an excellent basil. Um, stevia is really fun too. Nice sweet leaf. Can't go wrong with those. And you know what? I think I'm going to put dill in there. Like, you know, for like preserves and stuff, but like my very first job working at a farmer's market, I would have to carry in the buckets of dill from outside. Mm -hmm. And I just remember it would be in my face and I'd be like, I'm just going to put my face a little bit further into the bucket and into the dill to smell this as I'm walking. Every time I go to like Sobeys or Superstore, I like smell the basil. Yes. I have to like do that to it. Nice fresh basil on like pizza or on some like bread with some oil and stuff like. I'm going to tell everyone a secret. We've got like 26 people watching. I don't know if we released it yet. Um, our name that seed this week was Stevia. Nice. And I don't think anyone got it right. No. I think I think we tricked a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't grown Stevia, you really should. The leaves are that sweet. Yes. Um, I don't know how you turn that leaf into powder to make cookies, but it is very, very sweet. It's very sweet. You could put it in like tea to sweeten it without mm -hmm. needing to grind it up. Um, but it's yep. beautiful and the flowers are beautiful. Yep. But yeah, that was our uh, Name the Seed this week. And I hope people enjoy that. I have a lot I of fun. I enjoy it. Yeah, you, I stumped you on this. You did stump me. You did stump me on the stevia. <laughs> and you I, even knew. <laughs> I know. I was like, I was messaging you. I was like, what is it? And I was like, but don't tell me. It was like. And then I immediately told you. That's all right. <laughs> My reading skills aren't good. It's all right. Um, one of my coworkers actually texted and said that we read, I read Jeremy's question wrong. Okay. The question was, if you would be a vegetable, oh, oh. what would you be? I want to be an Atlantic giant pumpkin. I just want to be Ooh. plunked in the field and just fat and happy just sitting there like <laughs> this and be like, weigh me. <laughs> you know? Uh, what would I be if I was a vegetable? I don't know. Probably... Probably a pepper. Mm -hmm. I'm a little fiery and spicy. I yeah. think I'd be a pepper, but what pepper? What pepper? Maybe a poblano, just like a little spicy. Just a little bit, yeah. Sweet with just a little spice. Good. People like to be around you, but like you're not turning people away kind of thing. Right. Our yeah. poblanos were really good this year. They were yeah, very big. Yeah, they were fantastic. Um, Heather says, oh, I thought it was cumin. <laughs> she must have guessed on our name this seed. Right. Um, yeah, no, it was not cumin. I don't know what we picked for next week, though. I don't know if I've taken the picture yet. It's a, I, well, I take the picture, yeah. so it's going to happen. Um, we can talk about this cilantro that we have here. How sure. long ago did we plant this? I planted this direct soda into this pot January 6th. And we've been eating it. We have been eating it. I think I fertilized it no more than twice, and it's been getting water every day because I'm sure the roots are very root-bound, but it's just been loving life. And what else would you put in a container. Do you I, have something else here? I do. I grew some winter boar kale. I started these actually the same day, January 16th. Fertilized it a couple times. It's been doing really well. Um, you know, this is a, I think a good example of, you know, we don't have the intense sunlight and heat inside for winter growing, but if you do something that's, you know, non-fruit bearing leafy mm -hmm. crops, they do just fine. Yeah. And I mean, you can easily be harvesting these outer leaves and have the growth continue in, yep. in the middle. Yep. Um, there's lots of things you can be growing indoors in the winter. Um, lettuces are so easy. Yeah. Um, and lettuces, you want to go for like the leaf lettuces. You don't want to go for like the head forming, like the icebergs yeah. and, the, and the romaines. They need a little more heat, but if you, you can do leaf lettuces, oak leaves, no problem. Baby mix blend. Yep. Throw that in. 
Um, can I grow, grow glads and dahlias in a grow bag? You sure can. I have Not a, a problem. I, I remember to bring a grow bag this time. This is a smaller one than we had last time. Just a little bit smaller. We have multiple different sizes and colors of mm -hmm. grow bags. Um, how many dahlias would you put in here? Just one? How many dahlias? No, you could probably get away with two or three. Um, and then glads you mm, probably like, you know, between four and six, something like that. Yeah. Um, I also brought a different grow bag that we carry, um, which is a raised bed. So it's 36 round. Um, so if you don't have a raised bed or you rent and you can't put it in, um, you can plop these anywhere mm -hmm. on a patio, a deck, a driveway, a parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can put them quite literally anywhere. And how deep are they? Does it say on there? Um, it does say on the... 12 inches deep so you could even do you know some carrots if you wanted to too if you want to do some new carrots or baby carrots that would no problem even the ox heart nice and short yep. carrots yep. nice and sweet yep beets um, radishes would grow no problem in there take six cubic feet of soil to fill this mm -hmm. um yeah and it says it'll last for years and years mm -hmm. reuse um, a couple of our staff don't have um raised beds at their place or gardens and they grow in these um i think lilla put her tomatoes and peppers in these i think so um Super versatile. Mm -hmm. What else do I got? These always get a lot of comp yeah. talk when we plant these. What do you do with these cell trays? So I use those specifically for tomatoes and peppers. Um, what I do is I cut them in half, or not physically, but I, you know, I, I draw an imaginary line and I'll plant, you know, one variety here, one here, one here, one here. I can get 40 varieties in one tray, and then once they reach the, you know, size where they can be transplanted, they're just starting to run out of room in this for, for their roots to grow. Mm -hmm. It's perfect for growing a large amount of plants in such a small place. And did you plant um, your onions in these? I did, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, the onions will start to outgrow that quite fast, and they will need a lot of water, but as long as you keep up with the watering once a day, once they get to that mature point, it, they grow in there no problem before they go in the soil. What else do I got? Oh, I got one of our bigger, I think that's what, 72 cell? Yep, that's a 72. And then we have a 128 too, which is a little bit smaller. Yeah, it always says it's kind of imprinted on the side of the container if you, to save you from counting. If you're looking at your old trays, be like, how many is that? Yep. Um, and these are a little bit bigger. Yep. I would do like dailies and marigolds and that. Yep. Yeah. All the things. What else do I got here? Oh. I use those quite a bit for a pH tester. Um, so you take a little bit of soil, you mix it with some water. There's some, they there are some like capsules in there. You break those capsules open, mix it with the water soil solution, and then it kind of gives you the range of where you fall for pH or how many, how much nitrogen, how much potassium, how much phosphorus, that sort of thing. We've got a question from Stacy. She wants to know what's the best tomato variety for cold climates. Cold climates, I would have to go with either Scotia or Manitoba. Um, Scotia has been was bred here in the Maritimes, and Manitoba has been bred in Manitoba. Um, they're determinate slicer tomatoes, but they are bred for Canadian growing conditions. And their days to maturity is quite quite fast. Yeah. Um, when you're looking at like if you have a shorter growing time, look at the days to maturity and see like how fast can you be harvesting. And if you don't want a slicer tomato, usually cherry tomatoes will mature faster than like beef steaks and slicers. So anywhere from 55 to 65 or 70 days, whereas a slicer is anywhere from 65 to 70 days and up. Uh, my suggestion is always grow sun gold because they're the best tomato. Yes. They're the best tomato. Um, I did bring, we talked about this a lot in our last stream. Oh, yeah. This is our auger. Um, it's got a little plug on the bottom to keep it safe. Um, we planted, we have a bigger one as well. I didn't want to bring it up. Um, we planted all of our bulbs and all of our tomatoes, all of our watermelon. And peppers and tomatoes. Yeah. Our corn transplants, because we mm -hmm. trans, our popcorn, corn, it takes a long time, yeah. like what, 120 days? 110 maturity. days, something like that. Um, so we started that in the greenhouse um, and we started our corn in one of these 72 cell trays, one kernel per thing. Okay. Yeah, we use this. Um, this is perfect. It doesn't come with a drill, um, but they're my favorite tool. They made planting so easy, um, especially for the tomatoes. We did touch on it last week, but like tomatoes want to be planted really deep for better root growth. Instead of digging in there with our hands, trying to get underneath our um, bio mulch, we use this. We got, you know, maybe a foot and a half down and it was no problem to plant them. One thing to note though, um, if you if you do have a lot of um, 
we had uh, hay planted in ours yes. and we tilled it in. Yes. Um, so sometimes when we were drilling, you'd catch some of like the, mm -hmm. what's the right word? Not foliage. Some, yeah, foliage. foliage. Yeah, and it would get wrapped up. Yeah, it would get wrapped up. So sometimes, um, but the best thing. So for us here in PEI, we're extremely lucky. We have soil that's, you know, we get the odd sandstone that comes out in the fields, but mostly we just have perfect soil for growing. If you're in places like Social Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, um, the Canadian Shield, and you try to use that, you're going to hit bedrock, you're going to grab rocks, and it's going to try to twist your wrist with the drill. Mm -hmm. um, so just be conscious of that, that that's going to happen. Two hands if you know you're really rocky soil. Yeah, and there's no reason to go as fast as you want. Um, when we do this, we take it slow. Yes. We just barely pull the trigger on the yep. drill, um, and it'll go down on its own. Yep. Um, Heather wants says my mom makes green tomato chow what tomato is best she just picks before they turn red i think scotia is what she grows we're in pei i know a lot of people that grow scotia just for chow yeah we put in a whole row of scotia tomatoes for people yeah. to do that processing yeah yeah chow is uh scotia is one of those perfect tomatoes yeah i don't think there's any one variety that's better than the other though just you're harvesting late in the fall um, before a hard frost comes and before those fruit ripen Right. And will your green tomatoes ripen if you bring them indoors? If they have a little bit of color on them, they will. I usually aim for somewhere between a, a color change of a quarter to a half. Mm -hmm. And then if you bring them in, just set them on your counter, they'll eventually turn color. If you bring them in while they're fully green, they just won't turn color. They'll just stay green. I find that even though they'll ripen indoors, their flavor doesn't develop no. the way it's supposed to, which is why there's that big difference between grocery store tomatoes and homegrown tomatoes. Yes, yes, because they're usually ripening on trucks as they're being shipped to stores kind of thing, yeah. whereas this is fresh out of the garden and you're not going to beat it. Uh, right. We went over again. We are 406. Oh, we could just talk forever. We could. Gardening forever. <laughs> That's true. Yes. Um, we are going to keep this up. I think it's going to be every second Thursday for until you guys basically tell us to stop. Mm -hmm. um, we hope that you guys like listening to us. Um, again, this will be available on our Facebook page immediately after the live if you want to rewatch it or catch up on anything you missed before. We also will load it to our uh, YouTube page. You guys can catch it there as well. Um, if you have questions, be sure to drop them in the group before the live stream starts. So if you happen to miss it, we will still get your questions answered. We have quite a few questions that were sent to us. Um, we really want to answer your questions or we can just talk. Yeah. And if you have questions like for us, you know, you can always co uh, contact customer service. You can email us, um, you know, what does Cody think? What does Tara think? Or if you want us, you know, to answer the question on video, send it to customer service saying you want it to be with on the Digging Deep podcast. Um, we'll, we will include the question in a couple of weeks and we will answer it then. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining, guys. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks again. Take care and happy gardening.